Thank you, Sergio. Uh, it's it's a heavy task to compete with Marcos and with Dr. Huang. Um, it's good to see that my fellows have done so well over the years. Um, in any case, just a, a remark about cost as we are going to talk about that. I, I, it bothers me. Um, I think we should talk in in cost per life saved, we should talk in cost per patient cured. Uh, you know, I think as transplanters we end up talking a lot about duration of admissions and that's for sure really relevant, but even more relevant is how, how does it work out in the long time? How many of these people have GVH? How many of these people get readmitted? How many of these people have excellent quality of life? So I think it's a very complex issue. Why 1949 versus 2012? Because 1949 is when Leon Jacobson at the University of Chicago showed that exteriorizing a spleen protected the mouse from permanent radiation myelosuppression, which then gave rise to uh, the concept of a hematopoietic stem cells within a couple of years. And then over time, 1957, the Don Thomas was already doing bone marrow transplants. They didn't work yet. And what really worked, what really uh, made this field was the discovery of the HLA system. And this is, again, quite an old uh, experiment. Reiner Storp is on here, who's still at Seattle in 1971, and Epstein, 1968, uh, developed an HLA test assay in dogs and showed that litter mates that were mismatched by their assay all died of graft versus host disease, that litter mates that were matched had survival, and that litter mates that were matched and had GVH prophylaxis survived very well. So th this is the kind of uh, work that actually ultimately led to the Nobel Prize, and I think it's the kind of animal work that really has been extremely instrumental in uh, moving the field. For those of you interested in a bit of history of transplant, the British Journal of Hematology of 1999 has a wonderful paper that really describes this whole story. There's a lot more to it. But think about it. Uh, here we are talking about haplos. We are talking about mismatched cords. This is really putting this dogma that was then established uh, trying to get rid of that, trying to overcome that, trying to overcome this limitation. Because who among us have matched siblings with decreasing family size? Probably 10% of the new generation. Who of us have matched unrelated donors? One of the great advances of transplant of the last 10 years, the work of people around the world uh, is uh, high resolution typing recognition that molecular typing matters, that uh, all alleles matter, the recognition that there's an explosively increasing number of alleles and that they all matter for outcome of transplant. Of course, not the topic of this discussion, but it is because as we have discovered more of these alleles, and as we are better able to do these unrelated donor transplants with results that now mirror matched sibling transplants, we also find out that very few of us have these unrelated donor transplants. These are unpublished data from the National Marrow Donor Program in the United States, showing that for people that look like me, the chance of getting a, a matched, perfectly matched unrelated donor in the registry is about two out of three, 70%. So uh, a third of the Caucasians have no donors. What if you're Korean? 40%. Um, what if you're African American? Uh, 10%. So I, for many years I worked in Chicago and uh, I had a lot of African-American patients and I could tell them ahead of time, listen, there's not going to be a donor for you. There never is a donor. There never will be. Uh, so the whole concept of unrelated donor transplant is almost an illusion, like the, the concept of matched sibling transplant is an illusion. Um, Regist um, so from there, our increased in interest again in haploidentical and in cord blood transplantation. Now, which procedure is the best? I don't think anybody knows. I think the reality is 
Uh, these are all very deficient procedures that are all uh, in need of further development. So if anybody tells me we need a randomized trial, I would argue we don't need the randomized trials. We need small, innovative studies of novel concepts, and we all need to do our own thing and present the data as they are and move on if things work and uh, not move on if things um, and, and not move on if things don't work. That being said, um, let me try to summarize a little bit the data on haplotransplant, a little bit the data on cord blood transplant in a couple of slides with limited time, and as I see them, it is quite complex. Now, first, haplotransplant. Haplotransplant was already tried 30 years ago at Seattle, didn't work. Then there was the work of Hensley Downey in the States that I'm skipping here, but she tried to do a uh, very intensive conditioning, uh, trying to overcome the issue of graft rejection. So there were two problems, three problems really, graft rejection, graft versus host disease, and faulty immune reconstitution. Uh, Hensley Downey did bone marrow transplants and um, did T cell depletion and had about a 20% disease-free survival. Then came the work of the, Israel, uh, the Italians together with work of an uh, Israeli biologist. This work was really made possible because uh, GCSF became available. They gave very high doses of stem cells, T depleted them, gave an intensive conditioning regimen, and showed excellent engraftment, a very little graft versus host disease. They recently updated their data. They have now 250 patients. Uh, as you see here in the ALLs, they have a relapse rate of about 60% if patients are treated with refractory disease. Patients treated uh, in remission have a relapse rate of about 30%. In AMLs, the relapse rates are lower. Um, so this seems to work better in acute myelogenous leukemia than in uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia, and I'll come back to that. One problem here is still non-relapse mortality. And so for patients treated in remission, these numbers are not negligible. Um, the uh, regimen-related uh, mortality is at 36%. Uh, for patients treated in relapse, uh, the regimen-related mortality is 58%, and most of that is due to infections. So this is uh, really the, the big issue of the Italian megadose stem cell concept that most of us have tried at some point over the past decades and that most of us have been disappointed with. Uh, what is now the big issue, or the, the, the most commonly used and the most widely um, praised approach in the United States or, um, that has generated the most enthusiasm is the use of post-transplant cyclophosphamide, this time giving a stem cell transplant that is not T-cell depleted, no longer any T-cell depletion, giving bone marrow, then giving post-transplant immediately fairly high doses of cyclophosphamide, which supposedly destroy the cells that cause graft-versus-host disease and, uh, and that are starting to expand and therefore vulnerable to cytoxin and leave the other ones alone. Uh, these are the data from the Hopkins group. They have done this with a reduced intensity regimen. So I, uh, cyclophosphamide and TBI, then they do bone marrow, they give the patients mycophenolate and tacrolimus and give them uh, cytoxan 50 milligram per kilogram per day uh, on day three or on day three and four. Uh, they show very rapid engraftment, very little non-relapse mortality as opposed to the um, as opposed to the Italian data but have quite a high incidence of relapse. So 
and then I could go on. There's just no time, but there's the data of Dr. Huang that we saw. There's data from Korea. There's other data. I have just two slides. So these are the data from uh, Peking, as uh, just shown to you, with about 60% disease-free survival. These are data from Dr. Lee in Korea, and I think you have that paper in your, um, in your handouts. They have about a 60% disease-free survival. Then you have the papers from Italy in AML, CR1, again, 50% survival, CR2, 40%, uh, treated in relapse, 20%. Then you have the data from Hopkins. Patients with lymphoid malignancies seem to do quite well. Patients with myeloid malignancies, and, and that's where I would have problems with the issue of costs. It's great, there's very few complications, but up to now, it seems like everybody relapses. So how do you calculate that cost? Is that for the 10% of patients who survive, or is that for the 100% of patients who undergo a transplant? Um, I don't know how to compare all these data. So what I did is just put them together here for your uh, benefit. These are some data in aplastics. These are the very old data from Hensley Downey. Uh, these are the Aversa data. These are the data from uh, Beijing. And I would draw your attention to this, that the median age in all of these series is 30 or below. So. Uh, that the re conditioning regimens are sometimes reduced intensity, sometimes ablative. GVH prophylaxis ranges from extensive T cell depletion in the Aversa data, in the Hensley Downey data, to just giving ATG. Uh, and the disease free survivals range from 25 to 60 percent. I don't know how this. Uh, pertains to the older adults that we transplant in the United States. Um, I think these data here pertain more, the last three columns pertain more to what we do in the United States. Uh, data from uh, Hopkins, Leo Lesnick, with reduced intensity, I already showed you, about 35% at two years with further drop-off. Data from Duke, where they did not give post-transplant cyclophosphamide, but gave CAMPATH and had about a 25% disease-free survival. A very interesting uh, paper recently published in Blood from the group at, in uh, Philadelphia who gave a combination. They gave TBI, then gave um, lymphocytes, and then gave the cyclophosphamide so that they had an effect as uh, in uh, the Hopkins data. Afterwards, they gave a T-cell depleted transplant. So age probably matters. And I assume that younger people who have a, a better thymic function will do better with uh, haplotransplant than older patients. That makes it difficult to compare data. The number of high-risk patients in various protocols also matters, and it's hard to figure that out from the papers. So just put the percentage of papers, patients that were transplanted with refractory disease ranging from 67% to 20%. So. Uh, my impression is that the cure rates and uh, the underlying diseases may matter. Lymphoid diseases may uh, do in some situations better, like in the Lesnick data, in the Hopkins data, in other data like the Italian groups, the AMLs do better. As series have more children, uh, there will be more ALL patients, and that may make a huge difference. So what is going to emerge as uh, the best approach, I don't know, but it's far from 100% with any of these approaches. A couple of things that are of interest biologically are the issue of care mismatching, and care mismatching uh, depends on how one defines it, but at least in the Italian studies and in studies that use T-cell depletion and K-cells seem to make a difference, at least, again, for myeloid malignancies and their NK alloreactive patients had a much better outcome than non-NK alloreactive patients. Very different from the data we heard from Dr. Huang a couple of minutes ago, but they used non-T-cell depleted transplant. Data from Italy again, and confirmed by people in Germany, 
using a mother as a donor is much better than using a, a father as a donor and dramatically better. Uh, keep in mind, to use a mother as a donor, you need a mother. Uh, so this, this again matters for pediatric transplant. This again matters mostly for series where the median age is young. Um, so, um, so what did we learn from this? Haplog can be curative. Cure rates may be superior in younger patients, depend on the disease status. At least in these series, maternal donors seem, in some series, maternal donors seem superior. Uh, disease recurrence may depend on the conditioning and on the disease, and care mismatching may matter, particularly in T-cell depleted transplant. What then about cords? Cords cause less graft versus host disease, may have a decreased uh, relapse rate, have delayed engraftment. You already saw these slides from um, comparison between Minnesota and uh, cords and matched related, matched unrelated transplant. The cords have very slow neutrophil engraftment, very slow platelet engraftment, but also less graft versus host disease. Ultimately, the results were similar, but the reasons for failure were very different, and I find this um, instructive. So with the double umbilical cords, more infection deaths here and uh, compared to this, but le many fewer relapse deaths. Uh, the CTN trials that Dr. De Lima talked about, the haplos had more relapse, fewer relapse non-relapse mortalities than the cords, and ultimately the curves were overlapping. What we did then, I am running out of time, but what we did over the last five years, we, we were uh, enamored with the concept of uh, core transplant with less graft versus host disease, less relapse. We combined this with a haploidentical transplant based on previous data from a Spanish group. The haploidentical transplant is T cell depleted, but in grafts really fast, then the cord comes in, and over time, the haploidentical transplant disappears. We recently reported 45 patients transplanted with a fludarabine, malphalan, and thymoglobulin regimen. Post-transplant, they got tacrolimus and mycophenolate. Um, I will go fast here just to show you that our median age was 50. Our patients were rather uh, large, uh, many had refractory disease, 58% had active disease at transplant. They were rather in good condition. Um, without much um, detail here, but the cord cell dose that we used was much lower than most other centers, about one and a half times uh, 10 to the 7 nucleated cells, but our cords were better matched than most. In any case, uh, this is our incidence or our rate of platelet and neutrophil recovery. So the neutrophil recovery is very reliable at day 10 with a couple of outliers where the whole procedure didn't work or where the haplo didn't take. And the platelet recovery is very reliable at day 19, again with a couple of outliers. Mm -hmm. So we get a recovery of blood counts similar to matched sibling transplant or similar, similar to a haploidentical transplant. But what happens over time is that the haplo in blue here disappears and the court takes over. This is day 14, day 60, day 100. So over time, the court takes over. Although there's particularly in the T cells sometimes some persistence of lymphocytes from the haplo and even some host lymphocytes that persist. This is our relapse rate, 11% at 100 days, 30% at a year. Treatment-related mortality, 9% at 100 days, 28% at a year. Progression-free survival and overall survival, 55%. In a group of patients that had mostly, um, mostly uh, active disease at the time of transplant. Is this better or worse uh, than anything else? I, 
I think it is interesting. I hope to continue to study this, and I truly believe there's the, I didn't have chance to show you all the data, but the incidence of graft versus host disease, both chronic and acute, is quite low. The biggest problem here was EBV reactivation. That turned out to be relatively manageable, but that one has to be careful about. These are comparisons between our recurrence rates after the haplocort and after matched and related donor or related at the same institution using um, the same conditioning regimen. So again, relapse rates seem to be quite low. Long-term survival, similar in high-risk patients, and this comes very similar to Dr. Huang's data, our haplocorts seem to have better survival in the long run. Why would courts have, and this is the last thing that I'll show, why would courts have a low relapse rate? Uh, until recently, I had never heard a good explanation from it, but there's some excellent data coming out that courts are contaminated by maternal lymphocytes. A fetus has between 0.1 and half a percent of maternal lymphocytes, and most of us probably still have cells from our mothers, and the mothers in this room have cells of their children at small numbers. So there's a theory that it is these maternal umbilical cord, these maternal cells that are hidden in the umbilical cord, here clumsily drawn, that are primed against this cord that really has antigens from the father and that therefore also attack the leukemia and the recipient. There's some patients where this is not, this schema is not going to work. Um, but anyway, Dr. Van Root, one of the inventors of HLA typing, is now probably 80 years old, but still brighter than most of us. And he looked at this, and in a retrospective analysis and of courts done at the, uh, through the New York Blood Bank, and found that courts were, at least in theory, the maternal cells would have activity against the inherited paternal antigen had clearly a much lower incidence of relapse than uh, the courts that didn't have that shared EPA target. And that was recently published. So this may provide finally some kind of explanation of why the courts have this profound GVL effect. So Reduced intensity haplocort results in predictable engraftment. Recurrence rates may be decreased. Um, the technology is rapidly evolving, I think, is the real message. And uh, each of these procedures work. The technology needs to continue to evolve, and everybody has a donor. With that, I've worked for many years at the UFC and have a lot of wonderful colleagues there who helped me, but I've recently moved to New York. Thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. Dr. Rosen. Poon, you began your presentation talking about the value of animal models. Mm -hmm. uh, what do the animal models tell us uh, in terms of the haploidentical versus cord, or what insights do we have now? I have no good answers on whether one, uh, no answers. Good question, but I don't know the answers. I don't know whether anybody knows. I think this is a place where the, actually our human experience is going quicker than the animal model to develop. And the reality is the patients are coming through and there are a lot of them. And it's the funds to design some of these animal trials the same way that Seattle, you know, developed canning model can, you know, during all these periods are simply not there. But it's a very good like, point. I don't know whether this has been done in dogs and like the, the NK cell system it's quite dissimilar between murin and human. Mm -hmm. I'm from the myeloma department at Emily Anderson. There's lots of good biological immunoregulatory agents, such as lenalidomide, bortezomib, carfizumab, and the uh, recently BTK inhibitor. Those, uh, I rarely see these agents incorporated into the slides I saw today. So what is... What are we going to do? Are we going to incorporate those agents uh, in your trials? Or what, 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 which direction are we uh, heading? I, I'll go. I, I think, okay, as you see, each of these approaches has still 30% relapse rate, 40% relapse rate. So there's, uh, 
a huge potential there for intervention. Uh, and, and all of us can tell you anecdotes of people going on lenalidomide and getting durable remissions all of a sudden after post-transplant relapse or going on the satinib after relapse for ALL, though previously resistant, and then all of a sudden eradicating their disease. So the combination of these medical interventions and, and GVL effects, I think, is, is the future, and perhaps a more elegant future than DLIs, um, because DLIs are also, like ATG, ill-defined uh, products. Um, how to do the right trials is quite difficult. Um, and for example, on lenalidomide, there's already a randomized trial from the Dutch in uh, post allo transplant, and the conclusion is it causes GVH and doesn't work. But is that correct? Or is that correct in the setting they did their transplants? Would that be correct in a T cell depleted transplant? Would that be correct with a different dose of lenalidomide? Uh, I've seen it work in at least three or four patients, but how to prove that and how to balance that is a very complex question. Uh, Dr. Esti used to say too many things to try, and uh, it's designing the trials is, is a big, complicated issue. Thank you very much.